esta noche. Cristina, la veneno. Sí, llámame Cristina porque mi nombre no es veneno, es un apodo. Ahora vamos a hablar de la veneno. Su imagen tan distinta a la de hace 10 años. Ha vuelto. Qué fuerte. Cristina la veneno. ¿Una veneno? ¿Una de la tele? Oye, soy fan, ¿eh? Que me encanta. ¿Veníamos buscando a Cristina? Es que nos han dicho que está aquí arriba. No, tan informada la mente. ¡Eh! ¿Eres tú mi fan? Soy yo. Uy. Entonces, soy fan mío. Hay mucho, desde siempre. Toma, nena. Ya tú qué bonita son. Mi arma. De Zurtana, de Mora, de India. Como la boca junta. ¿Y cuándo supiste que eras una mujer? ¿Yo? De toda la vida. Un escándalo. ¿Y tú? ¿Yo qué? Favorite Nerdy Girl here is back with another review and you guessed it and it's for Veneno on HBO Max. Nerdy Girl Reviews will be back shortly with my commentary. Again, my videos are available on YouTube and if you'd like to see my other recap videos, you can visit sofritoforyoursoul.com. Stay tuned. Okay, y'all, we're gonna change the soundtrack just a little bit, just so that I can talk. Uh, yes, tonight's beverage is by Barefoot, and this is Fruit Scotto, peach, peach flavored. Matches my aesthetic too, which I like. And uh, we're listening to Gypsy King's um, Do Do Bijou Ba. It's a classic from the 80s. Um, and uh, the last, song that we were listening to is by the Los Chamores and uh, their song is entitled Dame Veneno which actually inspired our leading character's um, name you know when she um, decided to to take on the profession as a sex worker um, she wanted something a little more with a lot more pizzazz so she went with Cristina La Veneno so, again, hence the HBO series called Veneno. So, a cheers to her, a cheers to this series, and let's get into the commentary. Let, let's try this first. Mm. Very fruity, very nice, nice, like a nice sangria. So, yes, let's get into this um, eight-part series. Okay, I'm a little late on it, I know, but again, I just got my subscription, so yay, so we can see all the goodies from HBO. Um, again, I have been a fan of like uh, Spanish films for the longest, so to me, this is like second nature. I mean, if, and this is just a few, again, like when I say I'm a fan, I am a fan, you know, all of... Pedro Madovas, and these are the ones that I have like a hard copy, okay? <laughs> this doesn't include the ones on the cloud, okay? Um, so I gotta say, not for nothing though, I believe, this is not, this series has nothing to do with Pedro Amadova, but I wanna say that a lot of um, the Spanish elite acting community is part of the series, which was eye-opening. And I was like, well, I know this person, and I saw them in this other film, whatever. So, again, like, if you've been to Pedro Amadova's film, um, you know, film movie boot camp, <laughs> you were probably in this film. Not to mention there's a lot of up-and-coming talent, which was just uh, extraordinary to see in this, in this series. So, the creators behind the Veneno, um, the series, the, because it was a book, and so they adapted it for the for the HBO series is 
um, created and directed by Javi, Javi Ambrosi and Javi, Javier Calvo. The Javis is their um, tag name. So nonetheless, they have um, brought a fresh perspective to um, you know the writer's original book, which I believe her name in the in the series and who she she's an actual journalist this is an actual again this is a biopic. So um, Valeria Vegas is the the book author and the the book that's based on La Veneno uh, is called Diga ni puta ni ni santa, which I thought was a clever. A very clever uh, title so um, yeah I'm not gonna be translating you know I'm sure you know a lot of my Spanish speakers know what I'm saying but again you know you can google it nonetheless um, the series is eight parts every episode is uh, a riveting hour long and we go down the breakdown of La Veneno's life from when she started uh, as a young boy uh, uh you know we see like the beginnings of how he was identifying himself and unfortunately the you know the child was being raised in a very catholic oriented uh family household where that was frowned upon you know just gay life was frowned upon so let alone transgender um you know, he came from a very small town, uh, Adri, Adra, Adra in Valencia, a uh, community in Madrid, and very close-minded. Uh, you know, he was experimenting his his mother for the from jump. I think um, just didn't want to uh, embrace the idea that you know he she may have had a transgender child, and so she was adamant about just beating it out of him, uh, tried religion, tried everything, but it was in his nature. It was, it was innate that he found himself feeling very feminine, appealing more to his femininity. And, you know, he had other friends that shared the same kind of commonality, but, you know, again, you can only do so much. Um, uh, the unfortunate part is that he ends up having to leave the home. He thankfully finally finds a... A, a woman who's a beautiful Samaritan and realized that this child was being abused at home because of who he was and she never criticized him nothing like whatever whims that he wanted she would try to fulfill she was like a seamstress so she would do like these outfits but once she realized that like he wanted to lead this you know flamboyant life and out loud uh, it became an issue where he was getting beat up almost to a bloody pulp so she realized that, you know, if he was going to continue to live, he was going to have to leave and get out of Dodge. So he does do that. And he's able to leave with his other sister, who I believe was all, was bisexual or possibly transgender as well. And she just like she she had had it with that mom. So she also gets out of there and takes him on the road with him, with her. And um, and on the road, you can see like there. They stay with a very rich family home that has a, a farm and, and needed extra handlers, and so he's able to kind of live off, off of the off of the family, and but also working. So he would tend the farm as well. I think he was a great hand. He would uh, tend the cattle on the farm, and then um, he realizes that the family is semi open to other lifestyles, and he's able to kind of go through the self discovery of who he was. If he genuinely was gay, if he was transgender, he goes through a number of caps before he realizes that his path, his journey was to become a woman. Um, you know, we explore the 70s and the 80s of his self-discovery in discotheques and, you know, one night affairs. And then he realizes that one night, I believe he, got, he had participated in a dating show and is given a free trip to Indonesia and is met with a transgender performer. And, you know, she had lady parts, but she also had boy parts. And he was like, ah, it's like the puzzle, final puzzle piece for who he wanted to lead, how he wanted to lead his life. So that's, that's accomplished. 
but the thing is that unfortunate this is an unfortunate soul because he left his house at 13 he didn't get much of an education so it's not like he would he can go and get an office job or whatever the case may be he was lucky that he was able to even find a soup kitchen job in a hospital but once he wanted to lead his life he has met with a transgender prostitute and her name was Cristina and she realizes that she was kind of ambiguous she didn't know you know exactly exactly what direction she wanted to lead and she helps her out with some you know hormonal um, hormonal pills medication so he she can begin her uh, her transition uh, so in beginning the transition a lot of people who were working with him were kind of like no we don't we, we don't cater to that you know remember this is like the 1980s early 1980s Spain nothing was like oh we're all let be you know it was it was uncomfortable for some people who were very stern some patients that were not accustomed to seeing transgender people and for that time and so he had no other option but to you know look for the streets like the person who influenced him become a sex worker and I want to make a point here because um, Pose also makes this a point that how life I mean well, you have to measure um, success based on pitfalls and you know perhaps things that that weren't successful in the past and you know though people can lead their lives you know some somewhat um, open now and a lot more successful a show like pose can exist but back in the 80s you had to like lead your life in, in the shadows and darkness and so that is the focus for this particular piece and not that you wouldn't see that in these films that I just showed but um, I want to say because of triumphs like a show like pose that I believe American audiences are a lot more open to seeing that you know on on film or in TV series that it is a struggle and pro po quite possibly um, still is because there's a huge percentage of homeless LGBTQ um, you know community that because they're disowned and some of them are just left out in the street to, to fend for themselves there is a huge percentage of kids that are homeless because of it so it, things haven't necessarily changed 180 but I want to say because of art because of influences like Pose that we're seeing a lot more changes and uh, and we're starting to see uh, an expansion when it comes to Hollywood so this series and I applaud HBO for um, you know adapting it um, and adding it to the HBO ro roster because now we're exposed to all of this Spanish talent you know I want to say that these two are like the golden boys they're like the new Diego Luna and Gael like you know they're <laughs> but like Spanish so I feel like after this series and the momentum that it caught the wave of popularity, I think they're onto something. Like, they're going to be doing great things. They're probably going to be working with Pedro <laughs> and be giving him a run for his money. But I do also want to point out that they had um, their three main roles, aside from the children, which were also very important in the film. But their three main roles that play Cristina through her transition, through her post-transition, and then her, you know, adult life leading almost near to her demise were transgender actresses. And that's also pivotal. Again, I'm not saying, we're, you know, in the acting community, you can honestly, you're supposed to play whatever is thrown at you. But it's hard when you're not, you haven't walked through that. You haven't actually lived that life you haven't lived and breathed that journey and i want to say from jadet to daniela santiago to isabella torres those were the three main actresses they embodied because th remember this is a biopic you can literally go on youtube and you can see every interview that veneno gave and they really embodied that skin that personality to the t so bravo to you ladies i honestly i would hope that they get nominated because they did a triumphant um portrayal of this one particular woman i mean that's hard three different actresses for one one particular person um and even lola rodriguez who plays um you know the the actress i mean i'm sorry the the author 
she did a great job too because the author valeria um you know when she discovers veneno remember she had been a fan since she was a child finds her she's still in college you know trying to get her ba in journalism she decides to write this essay and is influenced by actually meeting her, meeting her friends. Paca, Paca was uh, the bomb. She's the bomb big, diggity friend that you want on your side who always has your back. <laughs> but they realized that she herself was kind of going through the transition, uh, tr transitional path and journey that she also wanted to become a woman. So Valeria, the real Valeria, you know, went through this period of transition and then also turning um, Veneno's life story into a book and then it, 10 years later it was published it was a phenomenon it took off she had to self-publish it but she kept the coins because she self-published and now look it is a part of pop culture now with Veneno so um, it goes through pitfalls it goes through so many um you know heartbreaking scenes you didn't realize i i didn't i wasn't aware of this personality i want to say these are the type of personalities that honestly pop for like um, spanish tv for latin american tv when i started watching the show especially because of all the commentary i was hearing online the first thing that kind of popped in my head was like uh, Nurka, Nurka Marcos. I don't know if anybody remembers. And I believe she's still very popular uh, in Mexico. But I think she's Cuban and she made her career in Mexico. But she was one of those outlandish women. And like, yes, this is my body. And I'm not going to hide my body and my desires. And I'm going to sleep as well. <laughs> so she was like, but I want to say that Veneno was like, the start of that like you know of boisterous women women who put their personalities out there and heaven care what people think of what they're gonna you know oh my god i can't believe this woman you know she her first interview uh based on remember she was also found in the street she was doing her street work and a camera woman journalist was like i need something hot sensational and she finds this goddess of a sex worker which was veneno and so somehow she does some like super convincing which she was not buying at the beginning and also the way she bombards her at the beginning and Paca, Paca was smart she was like you can't just come bombarding in her life you gotta ask nicely you gotta warm up to her that was smart and so when she goes on uh television for the first time her boobs her boobies are all oh, wow like she had the nip slip all types of crazy but nonetheless she wasn't ashamed of them. She was like, this is who I am. This is who I'm going to be. And I want to say that that was the antithesis to what we saw in terms of Spanish television. I don't know now she influenced, but I'm sure she did. And a lot of women that became super famous based on, I'm going to be me. This is me. I'm an, I love the skin I'm in. And she, I mean, she fought for that. She fought for that body. So <laughs> why would she be ashamed of that? Right? So, again, the story, the the uh, background on this particular um, person, how she has these triumphant moments and then has these horrible crashing moments because she trusted way too many people. They took advantage of her. She ends up in jail. She has a very traumatizing time because they put her in a, ma a male's prison for three years. I mean, it is... I'm telling you, it, but it's a masterpiece of a series. Um, it, it's it's through that lens, you know, of transgender community, of what it's like to go through that process, through that person's shoes. Again, I can't I can't recommend it enough. I was I was in love, enamored, um, proud that we're seeing more diversity, you know, on film. And uh, I want to see, I want to see more of it. So again, if you haven't caught it just yet, it's on HBO Max, uh, eight part, eight part series, about an hour and change per episode, but it's so worth it. So worth the binge. Uh, I'm going to be reviewing I May Destroy You next because I loved that series as well. And I know I'm late, but better late than never. <laughs> nonetheless i hope you enjoyed my commentary um you know give me a thumbs up if you enjoy and again keep viewing come back to my channel and i'll have plenty more reviews to come
All right, cheers, y'all. Nerdy girl.